Brace yourself for a crash landing. This is not going to be a soft landing. Fasten your seatbelt, put your head between your legs and kiss your, well, that isn't exactly what I was going to say. You know, I wanted to go over today, uh, a I wanted to expand a little bit on last week's video. Uh, Jeff came out with a great article and had some great insights. But I pointed out that on the charts, the scales were not the same. And uh, here we have aggressive rate hikes versus the CPI. And on this side, we've got a 10% scale for the CPI, the gray bars, and a 4% uh, range of scale. So 0 to 4% on this side, 0 to 10 on this side. Now, if they were both on the same scale, this uh, line here of the Fed funds rate, uh, would be way down here at, you know, this is at 3.2 or 3.1. So that would be right about here if it was on the same scale as the CPI. And then later in the same article, the Fed funds rate goes all the way up to 25% here and the CPI goes to 16%. So in other words, you'd have to make an adjustment here of the... Um, CPI, the gray line, you'd have to shrink this down from like here down to here. So I wanted to show you what these look like when they're on the same scale because there's something very important that you need to understand here. And this has, you know, brace yourself, we're coming in for a hard landing. Um, so here we have the consumer price index going back to 1947. And we've got the Fed funds uh, effective rate. Now, this is the consumer price index for all urban consumers, all items in the uh, U.S. city average. And so there's, I'm going to go over several of these because some of them have different inflation rates. You'll notice that if I zoom up on this one um, into the 1980s, you'll notice that inflation peaks at 14.5% there. And the consumer price, and I mean, the uh, effective Fed's funds rate was more than 17.5%. Um, now, you'll notice uh, when I go through these that different consumer price indexes have uh, different inflation rates. But I wanted to show this one because it is at 8.5%, uh, 8.6%, 8 which is about correct. Uh, but the Fed funds rate here is from October, and so it's only at 3.8%. Um, now, what I noticed here is that they had the Fed funds rate significantly above the, uh, the consumer price index all through the 60s and into the 70s. A few times it matched the price index, but it was usually above it. And still, inflation raged. The, the, even though the Fed funds rate was above the rate of inflation, which should, you know, according to Jerome Powell's thinking, that should uh, quash inflation by getting the Fed funds rate up. Well, he's barely gotten it up. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and so <clears throat> what it took here when uh, Paul Volcker took over, if you look at this, the Fed funds rate was at least 50% over the rate of inflation. But there are times, like right here, 3.3% uh, uh, 3 .3 inflation rate and an 8.8% 8 .8 Fed funds rate, far more than double. Uh, and this is typical. There are times here where it's only like 50% higher. But uh, you, a, a lot of this time, to get inflation down and under control, we had to go, you know, here's um, an inflation rate of 1.9% and a Fed funds rate of 5.5%. So to keep inflation under control, the uh, Fed funds rate had to be significantly higher than, uh, than the rate of inflation. Uh, well, you look at, you know, they had trouble creating inflation here 
uh, retail inflation. And I'm looking for a date when both of these, there we go. So effective Fed funds rate of 0.16%, and the consumer price in index was only at 1.7%, basically rounded. Well, today, look at where we've got to go. Uh, you know, you've got 8%. You'd have to go 12 to 15% inflation, I mean, Fed funds rate, to have the same effect on inflation that uh, Paul Volcker had during this, Paul Volcker and uh, Alan Greenspan, during this time of disinflation, lower and lower. So here's sticky price consumer, <laughs> sticky price consumer price index, less food and energy. And you see it peaking here at uh, 16%. And then Paul Volcker raised the uh, you know, effective Fed funds rate of 19%, basically. And uh, he kept it high, along with Alan Greenspan. So this is the same Fed, Fed funds rate, but different measurements of inflation. And this one is only showing a 6.3, 6.4% inflation rate today where we, we know that the real inflation rate is over 8%. So 12 to 16% is where Jerome Powell would have to take the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate is now a policy tool. Um, and uh, uh, it, it really, if you notice, um, they would set a rate and it would bounce the effective Fed funds rate after they have a target rate would bounce around now uh, it stays right within the range that they're uh, trying to set. Because of all these excess reserves, they pay interest on those excess reserves. Um, now, uh, this is another one. Um, it also shows a very low 3.8% uh, 3, 3 from October with a, an inflation rate of 8.6%. But it's the same thing. The, uh, the Fed funds rate has to be far, far higher than the rate of inflation to get inflation under control if they're using this as the tool to do it. Now, uh, the problem is, uh, if you take the $31 trillion that the U.S. government owes, as these treasuries roll over, they're rolling over to the new interest rate. And that interest rate will uh, the, the federal revenues, the amount we pay for the interest on the national debt will not just exceed our mandatory spending, but it's going to exceed the, you know, the discretionary spending, but also the mandatory spending. It'll exceed everything. Uh, if you go up to like 16% interest on $32 trillion. Um, so, He's got a tough job uh, ahead of him. What's causing all of this inflation? He thinks it's the low interest rates. But look at this. This is what they did. These are, this is currency component of M1. So that is currency in circulation, basically. Plus vault cash, but vault cash doesn't add up to much. Uh, plus demand deposits. So checking accounts, business and uh, consumer checking accounts. And here we are up at uh, basically $7.3 trillion that's sitting there. And uh, people are comfortable. When, when this comes back down to these levels, it gets spent into the economy. Right now, this has zero velocity. It's sitting there in checking accounts. And <clears throat> this will come out someday, whether it comes out especially as people notice their purchasing power diminishing and diminish, diminishing and diminishing, they won't want to hold this in checking accounts. They're going, going to want to put it somewhere that will um, beat inflation. And uh, that is things like precious metals and probably farmland. There's very few things that, and commodities. Some commodities are going to do very, very well. Uh, this is why we're, I'm, I'm saying Brace yourself, we're coming in for a hard landing. This is the 10-year constant maturity minus the two-year treasury. 10-year treasury minus the two. So this is the yield inversion. Uh, normal, when we're expecting the economy to be good, is when it's above this. When it goes below this, investors are more worried about uh, 
the economy over the next two years than they are over the next 10 years. They don't mind loaning the government currency for the next 10 years, but they actually are charging more to loan it to them for just two years. And so what you're seeing here, <clears throat> you know, uh, to get a hold of inflation here, you know, with what Paul Volcker did, there were these uh, huge yield inversions and then Paul Volcker got a, a handle on it. Um, this double dip in recession here in the 80s, this was a pretty vicious recession. Uh, and can you imagine getting a home, a 30-year home loan and you're paying 15%, 18% uh, interest on that home, even higher than that. Um, and so here we have the inversion that was caused by, the, we had the crash of 87 and then a recession. And then this is the inversion uh, from the crash of the NASDAQ, uh, the, the tech bubble uh, unwinding, and then the inversion. This is the real estate bubble and the global financial crisis. And look at where we are today. This is predicting something really bad in your future. Now, notice there's a time delay. So you have some time, most likely, to get ready for this. Here's another indicator. And this is the yield curve. And you can see, I was just showing you the difference between the 10-year and the 2-year. But the 2-year is inverted with the 30, the 20, the 10, the 7, the 5. And what, what's really interesting, even the 3-month is inverted with all of those. Not just the 2-year, but the 3-month is inverted with the... Th so investors are more charging more to loan the government currency for three months than they are for 30 years. So this is saying that there is something, re a really bumpy road ahead in our future. Now, one of the things that should do really well in this is precious metals. And I want, to, want you to take a look at this chart of silver divided by the S&P 500 index. So silver compared to the stock market. And, you know, it was like fair value somewhere around here about 10 times higher than where it is now that was fair value against stocks but when it went into this bubble you're talking about 80 times this there's, there's a potential 80 bagger here but most likely at least a 10 bagger in silver if you're if you sell stocks now buy silver sit on it wait for this uh rever this um reversion to mean, but it's probably going to overshoot just like it did back in 1980, and you have the potential for an 80 bagger. Where do you find 80 baggers? The only place is cryptocurrency. You don't really find those much out in the stock market. It happens once in a while, but this is a commodity that has a floor under it because there's something called all-in mining costs, <laughs> and and you know we're silver can't go down and stay down. Uh, then I, I want to wrap this up. <clears throat> Socrates, then, an unexamined life is not worth living. I'd rather die than not ask questions. And today, stop asking so many questions. Uh, you're a dangerous conspiracy theorist. And, you know, when it, with regards to all of these politicians that keep on uh, voting for us to spend more, uh, they are basically, they're the ones causing this inflation. Every time we do deficit spending, it has to get funded somehow. So don't blame a clown for acting like a clown. Ask yourself, why do you keep going to the circus? And this is a circus. We have to stop voting the, these people into power. And I just want to say, you know, uh, brace yourself for a crash landing. This is not going to be a soft landing. Brace yourself for a crash landing. Fasten your seatbelt. Put your head between your legs and kiss your... Well, that isn't exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. But brace yourself. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for watching. At GoldSilver.com, we have a price match guarantee, free shipping, global storage options, and phenomenal customer service.
Thanks for making GoldSilver.com your bullion dealer.